Hello, my name is Julian. Uh, I'm a tech evangelist with AWS and uh, welcome to this session for uh, uh, the Innovate online conference. In this session, we're going to talk about machine learning. Surprise, surprise, that's pretty much what I do. Um, so we're going to focus on, um, on Amazon SageMaker um, and, I, and what I'm going to show you today is how to bring existing uh, deep learning code uh, all the way from your laptop to uh, Amazon SageMaker. And I will use a deep learning library called Keras, uh, a popular one, so maybe that's what you're using. If you're using something else, if you're using TensorFlow directly or uh, Apache MXNet or PyTorch, etc., you know, stay with me because everything I'm going to show you works exactly the same with the other libraries. Okay, um, so let's get started. Um, so the first thing I guess is uh, you know when we try uh, when we start working on deep learning models, we most of us I suppose start working on our laptop, right? Um, and uh, we write some code. So. Here's a piece of code, right? That's a, a reasonably simple example that we're gonna work with today. Uh, like I said, it's using the Keras library and it's a simple uh, image classifier uh, for uh, an image data set called Fashion MNIST. So let me quickly show you what Fashion MNIST looks like. Okay, so this is the data set we're gonna work with. Fashion MNIST, you may be familiar with MNIST, which is, uh, uh, is this, uh, a very, very well-known data set with handwritten digits from zero to nine, um, black and white pictures, etc. So Fashion MNIST is a drop-in replacement for that. It was designed by a company called Zalendo. So thanks guys for building it. And it, it is a drop-in replacement. So same number of classes, 10, uh, same uh, number of images, 60,000 uh, for uh, training, 10,000 for uh, validation. Same uh, image uh, size, 28 by 28 pixels, and black and white pictures. And the interesting thing about this data set is it is actually much more challenging to, uh, to train on compared to uh, simple digits. As you can see, you know, we have some clothing and, and shoes and handbags, etc. So it is a, a much more difficult data set to, uh, to train with. So it makes it more fun, right? So uh, what we're trying to do here is uh, we're trying to train a deep learning model that will successfully classify um, those images or similar images, hopefully, in the right category, one of those 10 categories, you know, shoes and t-shirts, etc., etc. So probably you would start uh, with, with something like this, okay? So um, this is not a Keras tutorial, but let's, let's take a look at, uh, at this code and of course we're going to run it. So, First of all, I would define some, some hyperparameters, okay? And initially, you know, as we experiment, we, we would probably do something like this, define a bunch of variables for some machine learning parameters like number of epochs and learning rate and batch size uh, and some directories, uh, model deer, you know, where do we want to save the model and training deer, where's the training data, validation deer, where's the validation data. Hopefully you are not hard coding those things, okay? At least <laughs> you have variables for that. Okay, if not, that's okay at this stage. We don't, we don't really care. Uh, and then we would just load the data set. So here I downloaded this data set already. It's in, a, it's in a NumPy format. So the images are actually in NumPy format, compressed NumPy format. And as you can see, it's already split in training and validation. So using NumPy.load, uh, I can load the training and validation images. I can load the training and validation labels, okay? And these end up in NumPy arrays, okay? Uh, these are 28 pixels by 28 pixels, like I said. And um, although I'm using Keras, you know, I have a choice of backends. As you probably know, Keras is a high-level API, uh, very, very easy to learn. And uh, it, it actually sits on top of a backend that is used for training and prediction. Uh, so originally you could use uh, Theano and TensorFlow, but um, we also added support for uh, MXNet. Okay, uh, so here I'm going to use TensorFlow, uh, but you know, like I said, you could do the exact same thing if you used Keras and MXNet as a backend. So here I just need to make sure that my uh, my images are in the right format. Okay, uh, TensorFlow expects. Uh, channels uh, last, okay, and if you're confused by this, it means the training data that we need, and the, the prediction data actually, that we're going to push 
to the model should have this shape. Okay, so the batch size first, the image width, the image height, and then the number of channels. Okay, here we're working with black and white images, so it's only one channel, but if we had color images, we would have three channels. Okay, so MXNet needs uh, channels first, so it would be batch size, channels, width, height. Okay, so depending on the backend that we use, we need to make sure our data set has the right format. Okay, so just make sure Keras is not configured for channels first because that would uh, create all kinds of issues during training. And if channels last is how Keras is configured, then we simply reshape our data set um, with that shape, okay, batch with height channels. Okay, nothing, nothing too weird. Okay, we're gonna print that shape to make sure it's fine, print the number of samples. Um, there's not a lot of data processing to be done here. Uh, we're just gonna normalize the, the pixel values, okay? These are black and white images, so pixels are between zero and uh, um, 255. So we're just gonna normalize that to zero, to values between zero and one, okay? Dividing by 255, okay? Just a standard machine learning practice uh, to avoid training issues. Um, I have 10 classes, like I said, and um, the training labels and the validation labels at this stage are still integers, okay? They're uh, uh, basically the class number, so from zero to, to nine. So that's not what we want. Uh, if you're familiar with machine learning, you know, we don't like to work with, uh, if, when we work with categorical variables, we, we need to actually have as many dimensions as possible. So here, if we have 10 classes, then we need to have 10 dimensions and um, nine of them will be zero, and, and one of them will be one flagging the actual class. Okay, so this is called one hot encoding, and Keras has a very simple API to do this. Okay, converting the integer class numbers to bit vectors um, with all bits set to zero except one uh, flagging the actual class. Okay, one hot encoding. Okay, then I'm gonna start designing my model. So uh, uh, sequ sequential model, so first block uh, for convolution and pooling, uh, a second block for convolution and pooling, and the third one with um, uh, fully con a fully connected layer, a dense layer, to actually classify uh, the, um, um, the, 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 the images processed by the convolution blocks, okay? And uh, I'm adding some dropout in, in order to have some kind of regularization and try to fight overfitting in there, okay? Um, finally, the output layer will be softmax because I want to output probabilities. So I need softmax as a math function that makes sure um, that the outputs uh, add up to one, okay? And so they can be considered as probabilities, okay? They're not arbitrary values. If you add those 10 probabilities on the output layer, uh, they add up to one. Okay, we're going to print the model summary. Um, if we had multiple GPUs, then we could apply um, uh, this post-processing to, uh, to uh, help with parallelism during training. Um, we can just compile the model using the uh, SGD optimizer uh, for, uh, uh, for the training process. And then I'm training the model uh, using the data that I loaded and for the training for the right number of epochs and then scoring the accuracy against the validation set, displaying those metrics, and saving the model in Keras format. Okay, so pretty much, uh, pretty much hello world, um, with a few twists, pretty much hello world uh, for image classification with Keras, okay? Um, and by the way, all that uh, code will be on GitLab and you'll get the link, uh, so uh, no worries, right? You can, you can try it yourself. So let's run this code. And for the sake of convenience, I'm going to run it on a notebook instance because this notebook instance has a GPU, which I don't have on my local machine. So it's gonna make training faster. Okay, but you could really run this on, on any machine and on your local, your local PC, your local Mac, whatever. Okay, so uh, here's the code that uh, I, showed you, uh, I showed you a minute ago. Okay, exact same code, that uh, simple Keras example. Okay, here it is. And I'm just gonna run it, um, just wanna run it with Python and, um, and we'll see what, how that works. 
Okay, so well, that was fast. Okay, so we see Kara starting. We see the the shape of the training set, the number of samples, the model summary, and it trains very fast because again, I have a GPU and I just trained for one epoch here. I just want to check for correctness. I'm not even trying to get to a, a high performance model, okay? So we train for one epoch. We don't really care about uh, accuracy at this stage. Okay, it took five seconds. Okay, so this code works, fine. Um, that's good. So it, it, it works on any machine with TensorFlow and Keras. Okay, fair enough. Now let's take a look at a few things here. Um, so the first thing we probably want to fix is this, okay, the next step. Th this is fine, but okay, seriously, you know, you want to have uh, command line arguments for this. Okay, so uh, let's, uh, let's work on this. And the second thing we need to change is we're actually saving that model in Keras format, okay? Uh, and um, um, we could probably see it here. I saved it in TMP so that my model model is what I just trained for one epoch, okay? So, of course, if you use Keras, you know, the Keras format is there's nothing wrong with it. But our goal is to have that stuff running on SageMaker, okay? And um, the way the TensorFlow uh, environment works on SageMaker is that it serves model using TensorFlow serving. Okay, so TensorFlow serving is a model server, high performance model server, part of the TensorFlow uh, suite of tools. So we also need to change the format for that model so that um, TensorFlow serving can actually load it. Okay, so these are really minor tweaks. Uh, so this is what it will look like, okay? I guess you don't want to see me typing too much, so uh, instead of uh, instead of setting um, you know hard coded values here, what I'm actually doing is I'm using arc parse to grab command line arguments, okay, uh, for all those parameters, epochs, learning rate, batch size, etc., etc., and I can set some default values, okay. And, you know, everything else is the same, okay? And in the end, okay, it, it, instead of saving the model to a Keras model, I'm saving it to uh, a TensorFlow serving format, okay? So there's a, a simple API to do that. This is where you save it. Um, this is the list of model inputs. So what does the input layer look like? And this is the li list of outputs. So what does the output layer look like? Uh, look like you can literally copy paste uh, that code it's gonna it's gonna work for your your own examples okay so saving is no big deal um, and passing those command line arguments I don't think is a big deal so still let's check it out um, now we want to run that version 2 okay so let's just run it like this all right Still running, very good. Okay, and here uh, I have a default value, as you can see, 10 epochs, right? So this is why this is running for a little longer. Okay, and it's quite fast because I have a GPU on this machine. Okay, so let's wait for that last epoch to complete. Here we go, and yeah, we get better accuracy this time, 92.3%. Okay, and we could try uh, just maybe saying, hey, train for five epochs just to see if my parameters work. Okay, it says epoch one on five, so yeah, it looks like it's fine. So looks like I can use arc bars. That's good news. Okay. So I guess this is a reasonable first step. Even if you're still working locally, you know you can uh, uh, you can just uh, oh yeah it, it can't save it because I'm overwriting the existing model. Okay, never mind. Um, it's a reasonable step to uh, to do because you know you have more flexibility in um, uh, in training with different values and you can script etc etc. And actually, this is an important step uh, in preparing for the move to SageMaker. Because, as you can guess, uh, some of these parameters will be used by SageMaker. 
So let's talk about SageMaker training for a second. So if you read a bit about SageMaker, you know it's all based on Docker containers, okay? So this means we have a TensorFlow container, an MXNet container, and so on. Uh, and we're going to load and run the training script and the prediction script inside of that. So then we have to wonder, you know, what's the interface between uh, your code, this code, and SageMaker? Well, I guess it's pretty simple. The, the interface will be, you know, that code will be invoked by SageMaker passing some parameters, okay, so uh, where to save the model, um, where to load um, the training data, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, I guess you want to set some hyperparameters for the training job as well. So, um, you know, this kind of looks like um, uh, the input interface between SageMaker and your code, okay? And as we'll see, we're almost done. There's not much to change here. And post-training, we just need to save the model, okay? And we're good because we're already saving it in uh, TensorFlow serving format, okay? Which is what SageMaker, uh, the TensorFlow environment in SageMaker will require, okay? So we're, we're almost there. So the last thing we need to understand is how does SageMaker invoke the code inside the TensorFlow container? So actually it's going to uh, invoke it pretty much like this, uh, pretty much like we've done in, in, the, in the console here, okay? Except again, this is running inside a container. Okay, so um, SageMaker is going to pass some of the hyperparameters. So it could be something like this, you know, whatever we'll specify in our SageMaker code, as we'll see in a minute. And it's also going to pass the, um, uh, the location of the training set, uh, the location of the validation set, and where to save the model. And uh, this is how it does it, okay? So let's just ignore this, okay? This is act the, really the key thing to understand those four lines, okay? These are passed as environment variables, okay? So when SageMaker invokes your code, it's going to pass your hyperparameters as uh, uh, strictly as command line arguments, and it's going to pass um, the, um, those four parameters, so GPU count, uh, model directory, training directory, validation directory, as environment variables. So you need to grab them as environment variables uh, and, um, and process them later on, okay? So this is the only trick, so to speak, that we need to, to understand in order to run our code, okay? So if you just change, you know, those four lines, okay? You go from there to there. You can run this code on SageMaker without any change. Uh, and then of course you, uh, you extract them and then the rest of the code is identical. So that's the, what I call the input interface between, uh, between SageMaker and, uh, and your code. Okay, and by the way, this is called script mode. Okay, uh, so if you want all the details on this, uh, go to the SDK documentation for SageMaker and look for script mode. Okay, script mode means this. Taking your existing deep learning script, just passing those four uh, environment variables to it and run it unchanged. Okay, so very, very minimal work to do. And of course, don't forget, okay, uh, this uh, bit me initially, uh, you need to uh, make sure you save the model in the right place. Otherwise, you know, SageMaker won't find it and it won't copy it to S3 and you know, that's not gonna work. So, okay, this is really the only thing to pay attention to. So let's try and run this. Okay, so now we're actually using SageMaker. All right, so I'm uh, still on the notebook instance with a Jupyter notebook. Uh, the first thing I do is importing the SageMaker SDK, okay, uh, which you can simply install. If you want to install it on your local machine, you probably do something like this. If you have virtual environments or Conda environments, you know, you know how to do that stuff. But you, you need Keras, TensorFlow, SageMaker, Pandas, uh, a specific version of requests that uh, SageMaker needs. Um, maybe a few more things depending on your Python environment. For me, that's, that's what I uh, had to install on my local machine. Okay, then I'm gonna grab 
I'm gonna grab uh, the uh, Fashion MNIST data set, okay? And there's a simple API in, in Keras to do that. And uh, create on my notebook instance uh, a data directory, which is where I'm putting the training set and the validation set. Okay, so nothing really weird. Then I need to upload it to S3, okay? Because this is where uh, SageMaker needs your data to be. That's one of the, maybe the only thing that SageMaker uh, uh, in forces on you, you know, your data needs to be in S3, okay? So I have a training channel, a validation channel. Okay, so now I wanna see if this code actually runs inside the container. Uh, and SageMaker has a, a, another cool feature called local mode, where you, instead of creating a managed infrastructure, like we're gonna do that later on, Instead of creating that managed training instance, which, which takes a few minutes to uh, spin up, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, we can actually train on the local machine. So here it means train on uh, the notebook instance. But again, if you're running this stuff on your laptop, it means you're going to pull to your local machine the, the TensorFlow container from SageMaker, and you're going to train locally on your machine with that TensorFlow container. Okay. Okay, so it's the first step in validating that your code just works fine inside of SageMaker. Okay, and you don't have to spin up uh, SageMaker managed infrastructure. So for experimentation, it's it's very nice. Because it's, uh, it's, let's uh, run it. You see, it's uh, it's quick. Okay, so uh, configure this and just uh, just run it. So here, um, I'm not again. I'm not creating that managed. Okay, I'm pulling the TensorFlow container to the local machine and um, injecting, so to speak, our script. Um, and I can just use local mode by saying, hey, uh, instance type is either local if you want to train on CPU or local GPU if you want to train on GPU, okay? And I need to make sure I use script mode, okay? And I can pass some hyperparameters if I want to. Okay, and you saw it, it started immediately. So let's look at that stuff. Okay, so we can see, all right, this is how SageMaker is invoking the code inside the container. Okay, so here I said, hey, train for one epoch. So it is actually passing that hyperparameter and it's passing the model directory. And if we go up a little bit, okay, we see those, uh, those other variables, okay? Number of GPUs is one. Okay, and the training and validation, here they are, yeah. This is where the training set is, and this is where the validation set is, okay? And you can see it's a local path inside the container, of course, because that's what SageMaker does, okay? You put your training and validation data in S3, and then as SageMaker fires up the container, um, it will actually load um, the the data inside the container at these locations. Okay, so it copies by default. It's gonna copy your training and validation data at these local locations in the, uh, in the container, okay? And the same for the model, okay? Once the model is saved, it's saved locally inside the container and then SageMaker takes it and, and copies it to S3. So you don't have to worry about the interface, really. It's a, I think it's a very, uh, very cool way to do it. And the rest is pretty much identical, okay? We train for one epoch, and there's that, and fine, okay? So now um, we know that this code is training fine on SageMaker, okay? Uh, so now probably what we wanna do is uh, um, train it on a real instance, okay? So what do we need to change? Maybe initially when you experiment, you work with a, let's say, a, a fraction of your data set, okay, 10%, whatever, you know, just to figure out what the model should, uh, should look like and, you know, just generally uh, tweaking things. But then, okay, you want to train at scale and, uh, and you want to train on managed infrastructure. And the only thing that you need to change is this, okay? So uh, here we said train on the local GPU, okay, local mode. We just change that line to this. Please create an ML uh, P3 to Excel instance, okay? Which is a fully managed instance with a GPU 
And of course, we could have mm, several instances if we wanted, okay? Uh, distributed trading is available out of the box. Okay, here it's a tiny data set, no need for that. And we could pass, again, other parameters, okay? So let's configure that estimator and train, okay? And uh, it's taking a few minutes, so uh, we'll speed that process. <laughs> and uh, I'll be back with you in a, in a few minutes when the training is complete. Thank you. Okay, so uh, training is complete. It took, it took four or five minutes to do everything. So what happened there uh, is uh, this time we did create that managed instance, pull the TensorFlow container, loaded our script, injected parameters, etc. Okay, you can, you can see all those steps here. Okay, so again, this takes a few minutes, but you can do training at scale, you can you do distributed training, etc. So local mode is very nice for experimentation, but at some point, I guess for production or large-scale large training, you need to use managed infrastructure, okay? Uh, and let's quickly look at how uh, that code was invoked and you know no surprise okay it's called the same way Python uh, file name hyperparameters that I set model gear and then uh, again environment variables okay so the only thing we changed is this all right so you can easily move from local mode to uh, production mode right <laughs> let's call it like that Okay, and it trained for, uh, so billable seconds is how much time you get uh, billed for, as the name implies, so uh, just under two minutes. So here we pay for two minutes of that P3 to Excel instance. And we got an accuracy of 92.5, okay, we could tweak that a little more. So now we'd like to see this model in action, so I'm gonna deploy it, okay. Um, and I'm, I could deploy it on a GPU instance, just like this, okay? Uh, the the uh, least expensive instance, GPU instance that we have is P2XL, it's about $1.3 per hour. But I'm gonna use that new service that came out at reInvent last year called Elastic Inference that lets uh, you attach fractional GPU acceleration to any EC2 instance, okay? So here I'm going to deploy uh, to an HTTPS endpoint hosted by a C5 large instance, accelerated with that uh, medium size accelerator. We have medium, large, X large. Okay, so fractional GPU acceleration. Um, and as it turns out, that combination gives us almost the same performance as, as P2XL, but at an 80% discount. So my advice is if you are deploying to GPU instances today, please take a look at Elastic Inference, run some benchmarks, and um, um, it's, it's quite possible that you don't actually need a full-fledged GPU instance, and there could be a huge, huge uh, cost saving uh, waiting to be uh, realized here, okay? So let's just run this. Okay, again, it's gonna run for a few minutes, so let's, uh, let's uh, speed this up, and uh, once the endpoint is live, we can try and predict the model, and then we'll be done. Okay, so uh, after a few minutes, our model is deployed, um, which means we have a SageMaker endpoint, which we could look at in the SageMaker console. Okay, here it is. And we do have uh, an HTTPS uh, URL that we could uh, post data to, to get predictions. So we could do this in any language or using tools like you know, curl or postman, whatever you like. But, you know, in the SageMaker SDK, we have a, a nice uh, predict function that we're gonna call, okay? Just uh, to confirm the fact that the endpoint is working. So let's do that. So what am I doing here? I'm grabbing five random samples from the validation data set, uh, normalizing the pixel values. And then um, I'm gonna display those pictures and then I'm going to call, like I said, the predict API to uh, send those five images to my endpoint and I'm gonna display predicted labels and compare to uh, the real labels. So let's see what's, uh, what's what, okay? All 
right? So the first invocation is always a little slower because I believe it's loading, it's loading the model. Okay, it should be faster the next time around. Yes. Okay. So that's what. Uh, that's what. That's why it's a little slow first time. Uh, okay. So predicted labels zero one nine seven three, and these are the real labels zero one nine seven three. So we did a good job. Let's try one more. A2747, yeah, we're on a roll. Oh man, you can do no wrong. Okay, I wanna see a wrong prediction. Come on, you're gonna believe it's a fake demo. Uh, yes, we have a mistake now, okay. 62342, 62332. Okay, so apparently these two dresses, I'm gonna call them like that, are actually of a different class. Okay, I wouldn't know. But uh, this is what I told you before. Fashion and NIST is more challenging to train on than, uh, than MNIST. So it, it makes us uh, and it makes the models work a little harder. Okay. Uh, and so there we go, right? And what, again, what we're really doing here is taking those images and HTTPS posting them to that URL and receiving, uh, here, we, here we are, that URL here, and receiving predictions. Okay, and then if we're done, uh, we could just clean up and uh, take that endpoint down and we're done. Okay, so quick recap, what did we do? We took a, a vanilla Keras uh, training uh, uh, script. Okay, remember this is Keras TensorFlow, but it, it works the same for Keras MXNet. The only difference is MXNet needs channels uh, first, okay, not channels last. This would also work the same for PyTorch, um, Apache MXNet natively, etc., etc. Okay, so this is not just a, a Keras feature, it's called script mode and it works for uh, multiple libraries. Okay, and what did we do? We took, uh, so we moved to command line arguments first. Uh, save the model in TensorFlow serving format, which is what that deployment container uses. And then we actually integrated this with SageMaker by reading those values from environment variables, okay? Making sure we save the model in the right place. Then we trained in local mode first, okay? For experimentation and, and early tweaking. Uh, by just changing the instance type, we were able to train on a GPU instance, okay? And again, if we needed 10, because it's a huge data set, we would just do this, okay? And then we deployed it and we predicted with it, okay? Um, and I'm out of time. So uh, that's, uh, that's pretty much it for today. Um, if you're curious about more advanced topics like uh, automatic model tuning, yes, this would also work, okay? Uh, and uh, I'm actually writing a blog post on this um, as we speak, so uh, stay tuned and uh, you will uh, see more stuff <laughs> uh, on uh, how to uh, integrate Keras on SageMaker. But if you're curious, yes, model tuning would also work, um, just like for uh, 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 native uh, TensorFlow, native MXNet, etc. etc. Okay? If you're curious about script mode, uh, this is the uh, this is the URL to go to. We'll put all those URLs and and a link to my code in uh, uh, in the in the notes for that session. Um, but this is what you uh, want to look for. Okay, SageMaker dot read the docs dot io, uh, which is the documentation for SageMaker SDK. And there is a specific section on script mode, um, and the same for MXNet and the other libraries. Okay, so this is what to look for if you want to get uh, if you want to get started with this. Um, that's it for today. I hope um, you learned a few things. Again, uh, keep an eye out on uh, on those blog posts. Uh, you can also uh, follow me on uh, Twitter, uh, J U L Simon, and I have a blog on Medium, uh, which should be quite easy to find as well. If you have questions, ping me on Twitter, LinkedIn, you know, happy to help you out. And uh, now it's your turn. So uh, go build some cool stuff, uh, share it with me, and I'm more ha than happy to share it with the community. Have a great day. Bye-bye.